the moment I sat down to write out this script, I knew it's going to be just hours of me waffling on about the genius that Muta Prada is, and Neil Barrett, and Ralph Simmons, if I can keep my train of thought. Setting aside the fact that I can just go on and on about that topic, I saw several History of Prada videos here on the interwebs that were, in my humble opinion, fairly superficial, predominantly named or connected to the phrase ugly chic, and the talking points went something like Brothers Prada and or Mario Prada, official suppliers to the Italian royal household, Mucha, 1999 or 1999 and Kate Moss in a slip dress, some sort of Devil Wars Prada connection, potentially the talk about working with nylon and backpack mention is a must, and a tentative number eight, modern era Prada, which isn't bad or wrong, um, not my videos on my channel obviously, I just have a thing for Mucha Prada, um, you see for me it's the Italians who do it better and I firmly believe that Prada deserves more than oh what a lovely story summary. Luckily the world of YouTubers has just enough space for one more video, I checked, and I wanted to talk about it in more detail so So welcome, welcome to another episode of Linda K Talks. It's a mutual product world and I just happen to live in it. As always, this video is brought to you by my own research, passion, copious amount of sugar-free um, energy drinks, coffee, and a fear I'm starting to annoy people in my real life with my lectures. This is an unofficial but as accurate as possible history lesson put together from my best attempts at research and my own opinions. Signora Prada, se lei o i signori Bertelli vorrete mai venire a fare un'intervista, per favore dite ai suoi di chiamare um, i miei. Sono io, grande fan. Mutual Prada is like Meg White of the White Stripes. No one is going to argue she's the loudest, most extravagant, intricate, daring, popular and all famous person in the room. No one expects Meg to break out a six-stroke roll or go into a battle with Trav. However, its stripes are happily feature virtually any playlist, party or pub set or happy, almost everyone will enjoy it. It will continue to inspire generations of musicians and there's a huge respect of recognizing the genius, both the whites and what immense impact their band had on the industry, as well as Magwed as an individual, obviously. Let's kick things off with lukewarm housekeeping and stay true to some of those aforementioned chapters. Prada is one of those brands sitting outside of that preposterous empire of LVMH which either owns, has a major or minor stake in a number of luxury brands from fashion to spirits. Liquid spirits. I don't think they got into religion yet. Prada belongs to a parent organization, Prada Holding, that is co-owned by two companies. PABE has a 35% stake and is 100% owned by Patrizio Bertelli and Bellatrix uh, with a 65% share ties to the Prada family through Ludo company in which Mucha Prada has 100% ownership. Ludo holds a 53.8% shares in Bellatrix and Patrizio Bertelli and Mucha Prada have been married since 1978. So a family company. Prada uh, is the original house of Prada founded by Mario. Mario Prada in 1913 in Milano. I say original as Mario started his business with Prada Martino as Fratelli Prada. Fratelli is brothers in Italian and uh, Prada brothers sold leather goods, imported steamer trunks and handbags to wealthy travelers in dire need of luxury accessories, which is absolutely relatable. Not the wealthy part, not the travelers, just the dire need. It went so well that by 1919 they've got a stellar reputation and as you know previously mentioned were named an official supplier to the Italian royal household. The very first boutique was, been, um, was established in Galleria Vittorio Emanuele II in Milano in 1913. Look, 
I'll stop by and we'll make it a vlog and we'll make it a whole thing. But for now, we'll have to make do with Google Photos here, here, here and here. And thank you to the respective owners. Mario Prada didn't want women in his business. I mean, he wanted them on the other side of the till with cash. Other than that, not even a little bit. They weren't allowed to work in the shop, not to mention carry on the legacy, right? Mario's son wasn't exactly keen to take over the reins. However, Mario's daughter, Luisa, was a born businesswoman. And I'm going to speculate that the transition didn't go very smoothly, but by the end of 1950s, Luisa takes over the family business. And her skills and leadership took the business to another level, adding luxury handbags and upscale fashion accessories, following the evolution of sailing across the world to more attractive airline travel. With more travel, we sell more stuff. Capitalism can count on it. It's said that Luisa took the business to annual sales of almost half a million US dollars in 1970, which makes up to over three and a half million US dollars in 2023. I mean, get it, Luisa, heck yeah. Luisa was married to Luigi Bianchi and had three children, Albert, Marina and Maria Bianchi. Maria, the youngest, spent her youth studying and got a PhD in political science from the University of Milan. But fun fact, she trained to become a mime and even performed for five years. Um, she joined the family business and then eight years later, in 1978, everything would change. Starting with her name, she went from Maria Bianchi to Mircea Bianchi Prada, met her business partner and shortly after her husband, Patrizio Bertelli, took over the family business and made it absolutely explode. I need a drink. Stay hydrated, people. There's quite a bit to talk about when you talk about what the holding went through in terms of mergers and acquisitions. During the late 90s, there was a lot of commotion in the mergers and acquisitions department as Prada was trying to build a similar portfolio like Louis Vuitton, YNSC, um, Helmut Lang, Jill Sander, English shoe brand Churches um, and Company. Late 1999, Prada got her hands on 25.5% shares of Fendi, LVMH got 25.5% as well, and, during a, and it was during a time when Fendi wasn't doing exactly great but then all added up now it was Prada and despite the multiplied revenue the balance sheet was still all showing up in red. Patrizio Bertelli was slash is a businessman and through a series of decisions they brought Prada to arguably a very healthy state. Just to finish off the Fendi story my absolute dream of an Italian couple in 2001, LVMH became a majority shareholders with 51% when they bought out Prada's stake. When it comes to company's earnings, Prada reported 4.2 billion euro in 2022. That being a steady growth from previous year's 3.4 bill, with majority of the sales coming from Europe. 4.2 bill makes them one of the smaller fashion houses in terms of earnings, whilst I'm fairly certain that their profit looks very healthy. And it's all in the family. But back to fashions. Modern Time Prada has been formed and established by Mucha. So we'll spend a good chunk of time talking about her, her influence and her impeccable taste. And as I have been writing out this script, I realised that I won't be able to put it all in one video. So this becomes officially part one. So Neil Barrett and Ralph Simmons will inevitably be part of some other part. You know, part X. Anyway. Right after Mucha took over, she would start introducing new items. She's a creative mind and a women's rights activist who was lefty but hey, entrepreneur and a visionary. And you can find her explaining how, despite being sort of an heiress to an empire, it was the worst place for a feminist in the 60s. In 1979, she released her set of simplistic backpacks and totes, made of military grade fabric called Bukono, that military used for tense construction, but Mario Prada used it as steamer trunks coverings. It wasn't too popular back then, however, in 1985, Prada's now iconic bags made the it list. 
Mutra continued the simplistic dribble path, but added the classic logo that helped the bags become so popular. And the triangle, of course. So the logo was a Mutra's invention. It came from her grandfather, Mario, back when Prada was awarded the official supplier to the Italian royal household status, which is a mouthful. And to honor this, the original design came to be. The coat of arms and the knotted rope to honor the House of Savoy, the royal family, and Prada Milano Dal 1913 as a mark of its creation. Prada's main competitor back then was Gucci. They had no such thing as royal patronage and it really did help to elevate Prada to a higher level. The triangle was meant to be a mark of quality and a symbol of luxury. The modern logo design is a representation of Mucha, her preference for minimalism and neutral shades. What is interesting, what is kind of interesting is that the Italian powerhouse doesn't really use the logo in the same way as you'd seen at Louis Vuitton or Gucci or similar brands. It's not on absolutely every item. Prada is also well known to play with the triangle symbol and created this print, the triangle print, which is a bit popular as I understand it because you kind of know it's Prada but it's sort of hidden but I don't know. It's a bipolar world, that fashion world. What are some milestones when you talk about Prada? Well, the inheritance of the company in 1979 as the beginning of it all. In 1983, Prada opened a second boutique and there are few different sources on when the handbag, luggage and accessory company introduced shoes. I say 1984, year of the nylon toe release. 1985 was the year of classic Prada handbag release, which became an instant it back. 1988, Prada introduced women's ready-to-wear. 1993 came with men's ready-to-wear and, crea and creation of Miu Miu. And in 1997, Prada Lina Rosa came to be as a sportswear line. We're not going to talk about Miu Miu now. We're going to leave that for its own separate video. Before I start, we're talking about ready-to-wear. We are talking about the past, so here and there I'm going to be using the term feminine or masculine only to illustrate the distinction between those two personas in fashion. I believe fashion is for everyone, whether you prefer women's line or men's line, and I'm hoping for everyone's wear revolution soon. I do not have the how to do it. I wish we could just do it, but I'm, it's frustrating. However, just as a note, so what we're going to do now is talk about everything. Do you know Women's Wear Daily? The famous magazine. There was a small, almost insignificant piece on Prada's intention to show 70-piece ready-to-wear line in March um, for the autumn-winter 88-89 season. Uh, it said... The line will be designed by Mutra Prada, designer of Prada accessories. And just like that, Mutra entered the fashion archives. 70 pieces, mostly quiet from the fashion perspective, but started carving out Mutra's slightly paradoxical or anti-fashion work. The collection's tailoring was menswear inspired, signature Prada cutting made its first appearance, and it's just a lot of black and brown fabric. Mutra says... Brown is the least commercial color, so naturally it had a prominent place in her in her works. To contrast that, there are 1950s shirts and dresses in red and hot pink, ultra feminine, which are, as I understand it, the girly girl colors and shapes Prada wanted to wear as she was growing up, but wasn't really allowed to. Now shoes. This collection, mostly flat shoot and kind of modest, these paradoxes will continue to pop up and shape Mutra's career, or legacy, or both. Following collection, spring summer 1989, ready to wear, Prada sent down the runway crop tops, and I love a crop top. Showing off the midriff is very on brand for Prada, and I think doing so in her second ready to wear collection says it all. Overall, you see clothes to be on the masculine fashion line, sort of challenging the mid-20s feminine silhouette, influencing both grand Italian and French fashion. Prada showed dresses with East tailoring, boxy shirts, shirt dresses, new, somewhat conservative. Some of the dresses featured cheeky necklines and a little lace-made appearances. 
cheeky, fun, sort of dipping that toe into more daring waters. Um, fashion reviewers describe it as wanting to be a bad girl, but be good about it. Prada is designing very feminine garments, but continues to make them wearable. Stylish, tailored, but more empowered. Fashion that you can wear. What's not to like? Misha is really imprinting her feminist beliefs onto her design, which will only continue to, to explore their femininity or do the opposite, or mix and match. Autumn Winter 8990 ready to wear marks Mucha Prada's own history as the one she hated. Let me read her quote. For that, I have a fantastic book called Prada Catwalk. Strongly recommend. Do not mind the casual research consisting of exactly two postings. Because, you know, I went back and checked it. The whole time I was working, I hated everything, she told New Yorker. It was not me, it was a nightmare. If it's a mistake, it's okay. In fact, I like mistakes because mistakes are what life's about. Tell you something's alive. Yes, this was something that made me crazy. For 10 days, I was mad. I hated all the people around me and I told them it was the last time others would push me to do what I didn't want. Is the Prada spelled out using buttons is the very trendy, very 1980s strong shouldered silhouette piece of an interview with Fabio Zambernardi, who was with Prada as a shoe designer at that time, says, At the start, there was Versace, there was Armani, and everything was much louder than what Mucha was doing. No one paid much attention. The attention started to happen when the shows became a little more out there, with ideas and concepts that seemed more shocking. Shocking in the use of the wrong materials, the use of nylon no longer just for bags, and the exploration of ugliness versus beauty. Spring Summer 1990 Ready to Wear was dubbed by Women's Wear Daily as the sleeper hit of the week. That year, Prada focused on natural resources, colours and feminine beauty, transported into all shapes and fabrics. Significant wear PJs, clearly. Huge for Prada. Cross split up the backline hospital gown, which became Prada's signature style. Prada has a few of those. Um, all fabulous. Autumn winter collection later that year. Look, I feel like no one does oversized tailoring like Misha Prada. Fighting slightly against really low French fashion designs at the time and was probably the only major fashion house that did so. The power suit and strong powerful woman fashion came later in the 90s for other fashion houses. Prada continues to bring men's wear into women's wear with incredible class and retained luxury. <music> Spring summer of 1991 is Mucha's exploitation of ugliness of beauty made a big splash. Women's Wear Daily described it as the Flintstones meet the Jetsons, to which Mucha years later said, It was meant in a very negative way, but of course that's exactly what I loved about it. Obviously this collection was met with let's say raised eyebrows, but people were paying attention and competitors would begin to catch up. In hindsight, this collection is very much current midriffs everywhere hot pants okay that's that's mew mew now more than anything but still very relevant with some designs it almost seemed as Micha was drawing inspiration in pakora ban's collection from 1966. a little detour here his first couture collection called 12 unwearable dresses in contemporary materials because is it even fashion if it's functional coco chanel said about Paco Rabanne. He's not a couturier, he's a metal worker. Again, very funny, uh, you know, given that those designs are absolutely immortal. Rabanne was part of an emerging group of avant-garde designs together with Andrea Correges, whom we know from my video about Schiaparelli, and Pierre Cardin. They combined traditional couture techniques with futurism and space age. Fab. Modern days Paco Rabanne still features lots of these designs. It's a recurring trend, to be honest. And I think this is exactly why Mucha drew inspiration in those designs back then. She knew. 
So something to note about Prada, her shows and collections will slowly become a game. In the beginning, she's either referencing artists severely before their time or plays with the concept of anti-fashion. Later, you'll see Prada fine-tuning her earlier models or prints or referencing her design inspired by someone, playing jokes on mainstream fashion or referencing other designers either drawing inspiration in her own designs or trying to fight her by doing it better or referencing herself, referencing herself or someone else. 8 out of 10, she's you know, taking the mickey out of something or someone. And see, this is why it all matters. It is all connected. And she's so good at it, which makes it so good. And it's just good. Have I mentioned it's good? Good. Milan Fashion Week Spring Summer 1992 Ready to Wear. And it was all about Giorgio Armani and Gianni Versace. Mucha's show was noted as a small show that worked. This show features every future Prada signature. In the previous collection, Prada created furry balaclavas and, he and here we have florals with caps. Black and brown, powerful women's suit met her summery sort of jet setting outer ego. Crop tops, shorts, skirts of all shapes and sizes, particularly the red and white stripy fabric, gorgeous, lush, yet still sort of minimal and quiet. Uh, autumn winter later that year we're starting to really know the a-line silhouette as you can tell um, and the range of fabric with proper updos make it a bit 70s prada says she likes her clothes a little hairy yay 70s if you like it like that we don't king shame in this corner in the second like slightly sexier part of the collection where the brass and bra motifs prada's signature in black sequins and leather lining, sexy night out clothes in contrast to alpaca knits and camel and camel colored cohorts. Camel colored cohorts. Gee, I can only be mad at myself. I wrote this. Spring summer '93, ready to wear was described as '90s presenting '70s if '70s were minimal. Very sleek and toned down cohorts, sophisticated free clothes. These neutral long dresses made of hopsack with you know a pop of color those sandals were gladiator like flat or platform Later in autumn winter, Prada was raising a lot of eyebrows. She continues to be loved and praised for bags and accessories. However, Musha herself was perceived as a controversial woman. Her design weren't loud enough to be labelled as avant-garde. There was an obvious depth to her clothes, sort of blurring lines between femininity and masculinity. She was using suede, velvet lining, leather over knits, leather over silk, velvet on the boots. I love a good boot. Spring summer 94 in Mucha Prada's own words. The lady and the Chinese valet or the tennis player and the nurse. Prada is still a relatively small business or player in terms of earnings but now plays and competes with other most influential designers. And here we go. Kate Moss walking down the runway in a white slip dress. This was going to become an iconic moment. Prada's credibility skyrockets and we begin to see the mainstream success. Notable designs are see-through dresses with Victorian crinoline-like skirts and oversized tailoring and gorgeous green military coats and jackets and the shoes. Mary Janes with tall white socks. Autumn winter 94-95 is the first time Prada shows are presented in both Milan and New York City. I'm not sure this is the first, but it is notable because of the model that was over 70 years at the time this show showed. Model sported slick hair, red lips, military and the German cabaret during the war-inspired wardrobe, knee-high boots with a fronzy come on. Notably, Prada was credited for introducing new librarian length of skirts, just on the knee. It was written to the fashion pros, the on the knee hemline is the Prada length. 1995 and Mutual Prada brings what peeps like to call ugly chic to cheeky but sophisticated perfection. So what's important here? Firstly, the Prada length of every skirt or dress, we just talked about that, right? 
Secondly, lot of belt action. It always asks for content though. Belts over skirts, dresses, tops, shorts, looks like a belt really goes with everything. Lots and lots of Prada's black nylon returns every year as we talked about it. And you can spot the pattern of designs native to Prada being continuously perfected, like cardigans, dresses, shorts, bags, it all gets redone on the road to best quality. All the pieces are referring to 30s and 50s, lots of beautiful silk and organza. You can see a variety of shoes. The thing is, Prada's Mary Jane pump and copied almost as much as Prada's bags. What says women's wear daily? While many designers in Milan rely on fashion hype and fly-by-night trendiness, Mutual Prada delivers real style. Autumn Winter 95-96. Well, now we have other designers putting black nylon on their runways, but Prada had moved on. 1950s skirts, dresses and coats were back, and so were pyjamas, hay silk, little pocketses, what's not to love? Fashion journals very obviously note on the relaxed tailoring, but this is zero news to Prada and her designs as reason. And Prada will only continue to perfect the relaxed tailoring, which is not exactly following the standards of Italian fashion houses, but, you know, that's also zero news to us. We've learned by now. Spring Summer 96. Ah, oh, the full makeup prints enter the scene. Get ready. This one is particularly for you if you are into American diners in 1950s and, you know, the full makeup prints. <laughs> Let's set the scene of Italian fashion at that time. Giorgio Armani brings you the sleek tailoring. Versace represented by the golden rock print. Tom Ford went over to Gucci and made it a sexy brand. Much to people's dismay, what was that about? Prada is the intellectual, I suppose. Also, I read it was the most imitated and studied designer label in Italy, possibly in the world. Just find that interesting. Mucha shook things up a bit with this collection. She referred to a design show in 1980 with geometric prints on stiffened materials. Tones of mustard yellow, purple, brown, you know, very much standing out in luxury fashion fields, not necessarily in a good way. And allow me to quote an interview with Mutual Prada in Document Magazine from 2015. Do you know what? I love that I have these two post-its and neither of this interview. What am I quoting? Prada in Document Magazine. They thought it was in horrible taste, the famous show about ugly chic, which I think is a terrible phrase, but that's how it came out. In fashion, what was well developed in literature, in movies, in art, was considered badness. Still now, I think that a part, the more conservative part of the fashion world thinks that they'll stick with the idea of glamour and beauty that is so obvious, so old. Even now. It's not so different. Autumn Winter later that year was a continuation of prints and borders and lines, which Prada loves. And this collection is a little bit of rework and a little bit of an update. Chiffon is back from taking a break in spring summer and these embroidered slips are absolutely incredible. News, the skirt length, it was all about the knee length before. Chiffon button ups with frilly lining and those suits with trousers sort of piling on. Note those sandals paired with knit stockings, also not entirely a common thing to hit the runway in 1996. Spring summer 97 follows the line of those embroidered slips made of chiffon. These dresses and the entire collection is very light. And if you find yourself thinking, Linda, I've just flicked through the issue of British Vogue and these chiffon dresses, layers and smoky eyes and messy hair, this is very much like current time, Mew Mew and slightly Prada. Correct, I'm glad you pointed that out. 10 points to Slytherin. At this point, I'm not actively trying to make this longer than the Bohemian Rhapsody the movie, but if it happens, it happens. Meaning, I will still keep Mew Mew separate from this, but it is now a separate company, a subsidiary of Prada that started as a cowgirl-themed collection under Prada. Lots to talk about here, so moving right along, back to Prada Prada. Also, 1997 was when Mutual Prada collaborated with artists and featured in Time and Fashion exhibition in Florence. Not the last time we see Mutual Prada heavily invested in an art project. Autumn Winter later that year, 
I love this quote. By this time, Nuccia Prada was the undisputed leader of the pack, first lady of Italian fashion, who set the tone for seasons to come. This collection is a bit quieter, again toying with men's tailoring, lovely black embroidery on white dresses, chiffon sleeves with cutouts and crystals. Gorgeous. In spring-summer 1998, we're coming to an avant-garde work ethic. I'm not arty like that, so let's consult the trusty interwebs rather than taking my word for it. Avant-garde artists, writers, architects at all produce works of art, books, buildings that intellectually and ideologically oppose the conformist value system of mainstream society. Blah, blah, blah. Aesthetically innovative whilst ideologically unacceptable to the artistic establishment of the time. Yep, yep, basically what I've been thinking this entire time. Blah, blah, blah. Surrealism? I'm not bad again. I feel like we've accepted by now that Nutri Prada continues to push boundaries of stereotypical fashion trends and beauty standards which, you know, is aligned with the avant-garde of it all. I've consulted more literature, and it says about this show, that is, that it was exceptional to its overall lack of literal reference to the distant past. At a time when the rest of the fashion world was caught in nostalgia, Nietzsche was continuing to travel her own path. Thanks, internet. Mixed fabrics, imperfect prints with asymmetrical hand-printed detail, Random ribbons, which would be a great band name, pleats, ruffles, puffable hems, dotted with golden metallic silks, these made of beads, and impeccable white see through tops. A close up of shoes and some accessories projected as models walk the runway, you know, putting a particular importance on Prada shoe wear and accessory department. Again, not something that was done and or accepted in the fashion world. What a treat, though. Auto Winter is described as risk. A noble way of greatness by women's wear daily, a willingness to play dangerously unsafe in the name of progress. Shoes get even more attention, which is music to my ears. I am not complaining, but it's not usually the case for fashion designers. I feel like the focus is obviously on the clothes, but it wasn't always about the shoes and accessories as well. This collection is all black, white and red, and it's so good. Part of the collection's sharp cutouts, Pleats, boxy frames, these gorgeous dresses are crumpled on purpose. I feel like it's meant to demonstrate the I don't care effect of Prada. It's effortless, it's gorgeous, sexy and very much her own. And as always, bringing contrast into play, heaven it with silks, wool felt with chiffon, and it all looks quite simple. Just between us two, I think the Vuitton suggests Kia was trying to create women's wear in this French futuristic manner. At least that last collection that I managed to watch was that spring, summer 23. Uh, but also, he was just failing miserably in my own opinion, of course. He's overdoing it. Which, let me get back to Prada, as I should. Prada's autumn winter show in 1988, very much redefining runway fashion again. And welcome 1999, final collections of the millennium. Let's get into it. Starting with, yes. with explaining what Prada Lina Rosa means. Some of the Prada thingies are spotted with a red stripe. That is a reference to Luna Rosa, boat of an Italian sailboat syndicate that's been created in a matter of 15 days, who says money can't buy time, to compete for 2000 America's Cup, happening in October 1999, and fashion calendar is real, right? And that was a venture between Patrizio Bertelli, Michel Halpin, and Germain Fraise, a yard designer from Argentina, which I probably shouldn't have pronounced his name like that. My Spanish is virtually non-existent, so let's have hope, shall we? So they've set up this team, call it Prada Challenge, and challenge the 30th America's Cup. Prada Challenge won the Louis Vuitton Cup, which granting them the right to compete for the 2000s America's Cup. They lost to Team New Zealand. But that was their first attempt, and it wasn't their last. But to be fair, I don't really know much about sailing. I just, I just think it looks super cool. I love boats. And they stayed in that space. I follow Nicolas Pelitas, a Greek professional water sports athlete sponsored by Prada. Make and board, surf, writes just about anything, and, you know, he's amazing. Check him out on Instagram. Anyway, 
he led Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli, the current name of their sailing team, and they won the 2021 America's Cup. Long story long, red stripe on the boat called Luna Rosa. Right, back to fashions. Technically, the men's collection, Prada Sport, launched in 1997, and those two worlds merged eventually. Details, semantics, but it all matters, right? Now, Prada wasn't the first one to the key. For example, Dior had a sports collection earlier, but the pieces produced by Prada were just of much higher quality because of the very long history of them working with those materials. Now that designer sportswear was becoming more and more desirable, other houses were catching up, and I'm not talking about, you know, slapping a logo on a tennis racket bag or whatever. Prada had a history with working with the materials and they knew what they were doing. And here is why it was so important to Muta Prada to perfect their own nylon fabric, and it's kind of why majority of the stories talk about how it all started with the backpack back in 1980s. Others are just getting around using technical materials, but House of Prada is aware of how it all works and they spend years perfecting their own nylon and work and manufacturing techniques whilst other very likely laughed at the efforts and, you know, money invested into it. Life's funny that way. Neil Barrett, who was reigning Prada's menswear, helped establish both the men's and the sports line, which played such a big part in 90s and early aughts. He also made one of the first designer tracksuits. He was really, really pushing Prada uh, into working with nylon and neoprene and pushed the techno stretch fabric into tailoring, which was probably the closest to blasphemy as you could get. Tailoring and stretchy fabric was just not the norm and Prada made it. They created a heritage pioneered by them. It's really fascinating how the pushing for pioneering for not being afraid of the new, it was just something that House of Prada seemingly encouraged. I I love that. It's genuinely great. What was this backstory to? They're great. Absolute class. Back to spring summer ready to wear in 1989. Prada Linea Rosa women's collection enters in stark contrast with the rest of the show, but it sure as heck looks fabulous. It's sports clothes, but it's all posh and you know well put together. This still looks very much clean and quality, fashionable and functional. Trainers, obviously, and an array of bags, pouches, small messenger bags, larger fanny packs everything. And the other part of the story where full skirts and, and coats and ribbon edges, dresses, shorts, boxers and high-waisted knickers, chiffon dresses and tops. These pieces are in coated paper staying in that functional department but being highly fashionable about it. Note that gorgeous green, we're gonna we're gonna follow up on that um, in autumn winter. These not so designs with mirror embroideries, I mean I don't really know why. I'm I'm sure there's a reason and story, but what I love about it all is this entire collection is just continuing to walk that path of women having more than just one personality through designer fashion. It's showing women that a modern woman is just all these things and more. Autumn winter later that year was very much building up on that momentum of all things Prada. The dazzle chiffon, pointed colours, belted waists and those A-line skirts, those square toed sort of weirdly coloured shoes which I kind of love and the clothes coloured in a very vibrant purple, lilac, pink and orange complementing very autumnal selection of greens, this, this olive and forest emerald palette. New kids on the block. The midriff bib harness thingy, the straight skirts with a high side split, low boot cuts, and what I really love is that Prada continues to show the undies, knickers slash shorts, paired with coats and jackets, and I'm absolutely here for all this. With that, we enter year 2000. We'll cover that in the next part, which will probably be 2000 until 2010. I appreciate you staying with me until the very end of this video. Do all the UTV things if you feel like it, and I'll see you in a minute. Bye!